Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna get started. Um, hello, everyone in the room and online. Uh, my name is Alsbeta Klein. I am the CEO, Director General of the International Fertilizer Association. We are the only global uh, fertilizer association representing over 400 companies globally, and we have a very simple mission: help feed the world sustainably. I would like to, uh, first of all, welcome you here. And most importantly, I'd like to thank Thailand for the honor of hosting this event. Um, and I would like to give a floor now to Ms. Sang Chan, Deputy Permanent Representative of Thailand to the UN Rome-based agencies. Uh, over to you. Thank you, thank you, Klein, the DG of the IFA, IFA for the introduction. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are. I'm very pleased to welcome all the participants to this event, both those who attend online and those who are attending here in prisons at the file. At this event today, we will focus on the key and challenge issue of the future proving source and the available solutions to conserve and protect soil health for future generations. Let me start by recalling you back to the UN Food System Summit and its pre-summit, which took place last year in 2021. The summit has brought together several stakeholders from around the world to discuss how to transform the world's agri-food system in order to remain on track to achieve the SDG in 2030. Among the ambitious initiatives and coalitions emerged from the summit, I'm very pleased that the importance of soil health for food system transformations has been brought up to the spotlight leading to the establishment of the coalitions of actions of soil health, which is this one. And we all know that healthy source is the foundations of healthy foods, healthy people, healthy animals, and healthy planet. Soil health protections and restorations is indeed very urgent. And we want to grant the survival of our species on earth for us and for future generations. To protect and restore soil health, we need to engage with farmers who are the primary custodian of food. We need to enable farmers to sustainably manage soil health and incentivize farmers to restore the degraded soils. To do this, we need to better provide farmers with the knowledge on soil health and manage tools to enable farmers to produce more food with less. The challenge we face now, which we will discuss today, is how to make those knowledge available, affordable, accessible, and user-friendly, particularly with small-scale farmers, women, and youth. Because the uptake of innovation is much higher when innovative tools are easy to use, low cost, low technology, gender sensitivity, culturally acceptable, context specific, and eventually co-develop with farmers. Thailand as a major agriculture producer and exporting country recognized the root, crucial roles of soil and put these issues as a natural priority. And I would like to take this opportunity to share with you that since 1995, Land Development Department of the Ministry of Agriculture and Cooperatives of Thailand launched a project called the Volunteer Soy Doctor Program, decided to encourage farmer to farmer knowledge transfer on soil health and soil fertility. This project also served to disseminate scientific knowledge and tools such as soil pH test kits, which is a simple and easy to use tool to which by which farmer can evaluate and access the pH soil kits by themselves and also improve the fertility by themselves, as well as report the soil data back to our national soil database. We believe that the digitalization is key to achieve the more sustainable agri-food systems. And we therefore developed several applications such as what to grow, agri-map, the LDD on farm planning online to provide scenario based solutions and information to assist farmer to in the decision making for more efficient farm management. Ladies and gentlemen, today we will listen 
and learn more from our speaker representing Research Institute, young farmers, entrepreneurs, and uh, international organizations and enterprise. They will showcase existing solutions and discuss how to enhance visibilities of existing solutions, as well as to discuss ways and technology to make soil health data more practical and user-friendly. Let me conclude by thanking you all for joining the event today. And unfortunately, I cannot stay until the end of this session. But I do wish you a successful and fruitful discussion. I thank you and throw back the floor back to you, Karen. Thank you very much, Madam uh, Sankman Chan. This was really a set of very pertinent remarks. I would like to just say thank you again for hosting us and highlight three things from your uh, presentation. SDGs are absolutely essential, and I'd like to assure you that we will spend time discussing how we fit into the SDGs. The second one, soil health, is so critical, and you so aptly described how it matters to women and how it matters to youth. And I'd like to assure you that this esteemed panel will touch upon these issues. And last but not least, innovation and digitalization. I think we have a number of great speakers who are going to talk about it. So thank you very much for joining us, and stay as long as you wish. Um, so now I'm very pleased to move on to um, our panel. It's a very diverse panel, and we are going to touch upon many issues that uh, Deputy Permanent Representative highlighted here. And I'm especially pleased that we're having this conversation at the CFS, where vision for transformative change is all around these hallways here. Uh, quality data, actionable data, and using this data for digital applications is absolutely essential. And I think we're going to have speakers who are going to uh, touch upon it. And last but not least, as Deputy Premier Representative mentioned, youth and women are absolutely critical. And I hope those of you in the room will be able to help me in the conversation after we hear uh, the set of speeches. So I would now like to invite our panelists to dive in. And uh, I would like to invite our first guest. Uh, she's going to be with us in a hybrid mode, Lee-Ann Vinovitsky. Uh, Global Research Lead on Soil and Land Health at C4 ICRAFT, and she's joining us from Kenya to give us brief insight into data availability and data management. We can see on a screen, Lee, please, the floor is yours. Go ahead. Great. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today, and I am Lee Winnewicki. As you mentioned, I'm calling in from Nairobi, Kenya. And I'm so pleased because this is such an important topic. As the previous speaker mentioned, over 3.2 billion people are negatively affected by land degradation, which means business as usual is not enough. So if Margot shares my slides, I'll demonstrate three points that I'd like to make today. So one, in order for us to really scale healthy soil practices, we need to inform these interventions with evidence. And that means we need to collect data. And we are in 2022, which means we have so much opportunity to combine multiple methodologies so that we can close the learning loop between scientists and donors and farmers. And this slide just demonstrates what we're doing at C4ECraft, where we're combining systematic field sampling remote sensing and assisted citizen science, as well as to bring all these data and evidence together to develop interactive dashboards where people can interact, engage, interrogate, and visualize these data to make decisions. So this is really innovative because it's combining multiple innovations, monitoring innovations, and also engaging youth, lead farmers in this monitoring and learning practice. And the next slide just highlights my second point is as the previous speaker mentioned, there are huge data gaps in terms of our knowledge about the state of soil health. And so the next slide highlights the need for and the power of consistent monitoring frameworks. So this is just an example of one. Um, the previous speaker mentioned doctors, and this is the land degradation surveillance framework. This is a landscape scale sampling that happens at the plot level. 
So we sample many plots across a hundred square kilometer landscape to assess variability. I think you can see the background behind me. You really, it illustrates the variability in land uses in soil health condition. So this land degradation surveillance framework has been implemented in 43 countries across the tropics, across donor projects, it's consistent, and it has a set of indicators that allows us to track changes over time, and most importantly, understand how our interventions on the ground are influencing soil carbon, soil biodiversity, soil pH was mentioned, because what we have to remember is that farmers are at the center and we really want to be able to empower um, our decisions with these data. So my final slide, um, because I know we're um, tight for time, is just a reminder that it's great to have these data, it's wonderful to have these maps, but they must be used. And right now the farmers are at the center. So this is just a really nice piece that was in Manga Bay about how to we're translating science into action to accelerate impact on the ground. And I think that's why we're all here today. We're all here at CFS. We're all here engaging in the COPs because we really want to see positive changes on the ground, transforming our food systems. So you mentioned women farmers. Here we have um, an example of how farmers in Kenya are using these data to inform and tailor their interventions on their farm. And on the right is uh, soil organic carbon maps. We've been doing this for the government of Kenya in the case of crawl program, where we are tracking soil organic carbon, soil erosion, above ground biodiversity, tree cover across 13 counties every year to see how their interventions are impacting. So with that, I just would like to close that we must um, close the learning loop, make sure that farmers are engaged in the monitoring process alongside scientists, even donors, NGOs, and that we always must remember that these data must be um, usable and accessible to those who are making the decisions. So thank you so much for the opportunity to make this intervention. Leanne, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, short presentation. I have lots of questions for you when it comes to a uh, discussion uh, after the after the initial panel. What I'd like to highlight what stood out for me is the power of interactive dashboards and that is sort of use of access to data. And I would like to follow up with you on that. How do we make sure that the data are accessible and understandable to broad audience? And the second point that I'd like to de delve deeper in our panel uh, conversation afterwards is how do we make sure that there is consistent monitoring so we don't have data gaps because data are just so essential to the goal of uh, soil health and sustainable food systems. So th thank you very much for this and we'll uh, delve deeper when, uh, when, we, when we have a, a conversation. Now I'd like to uh, move on to our colleague and, <clears throat> and dear friend, Ronald Vargas, Secretary General of the Global Soil Partnership. Uh, Global Soil Partnership provides a lot of high quality information to governments and to others. And um, I think our audience at all would, would like to hear more about it. Please tell us more. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Good morning, everyone. Um, well, I have, I think I have some issues with the slides, right? Yes, okay. I will just uh, briefly share with you what we are trying to do in order to support all soil users. Of course, uh, we are in FAO, so farmers are our main target in terms of giving support through governments, of course. And something very important to, to, to acknowledge is that what we are trying to do is to uh, promote sustainable soil management. And in order to do so, we need to work in the different sectors starting with awareness raising and advocacy, moving into policy, but also trying to have the best science possible in order to provide with tools, with recommendations, and with technical support to the different users. Those being, for instance, decision makers who make the policies and develop a plan of actions, but also the farmers who are the ones dealing directly with soils. Now, in order to do that, of course, soil data and soil information are crucial. 
And we believe that is a very important component and we need to make use of the best state of the art tools and technologies for this. And uh, we do so through different uh, networks that we have trying to bring uh, and working with partners because that is fundamental. But the main challenge is on how to translate soil data and soil information into action. Because sometimes if you recall there were soil maps that were given names using taxonomic classification. And then if you provide that as a tool, it was not working too much because you need to find someone who translate that into something meaningful. And I think there has been a lot of efforts in trying to bridge this because we need to provide really digested information to the different type of users we have. In the Global Soil Partnership, we do that. We work on awareness raising through different platforms because people need to understand the importance of soils. For this, we need data and information that comes maybe from science, but we need to translate it for the general public and decision makers. We also transform this into policies, normative tools like the International Code of Conduct for, or Code of Conduct for the Sustainable Use and Management of Fertilizers. But then we also have technical networks. We, bring, we organize global symposia in order to bring the different countries and regions perspectives in terms of soil science and try to have a common approach. Then we transform this into a global soil information system that we have where our focus is country driven. What we aim is to develop the capacities of countries because we believe countries should be the ones trying to develop their own information, trying to move from the statics map that you have on the wall to monitoring systems because soil is alive and requires a monitoring of its health. Then we move with this data and information to the ground particularly to farmers and already our dear colleague from the permanent representation of Thailand, for instance, spoke about the soil doctors, which is a very uh, important Thai tool that now we are trying to export to the world because it's a farmer to farmer way of sharing knowledge because farmers and far two farmers have trust among themselves. And I think that is a very important component that what we do. So all the soil data and information that we generate goes digested to this type of uh, farmers using this approach. So that is something that we are doing. And I believe that currently what we really need to do in order to have soil health everywhere is to scale up the good examples that are, were, are working already. And this is something that we need to do now because it is really required, particularly now that farmers are requesting support for alternative sources of nutrients because they are missing them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Roland. This was this was really helpful. I think uh, you highlighted a couple of things that we'll pick up in a, in a follow-up conversation, and that is, how do you translate data into action? Data is just you know, a good piece of information, but what does it really mean? And how do you actually make a policy out of it? How do you make action for the farmer? Um, and the second point I'd like to highlight is this critical point of farmer education, farmer to farmer, where there is a level of trust. There is oftentimes many initiatives where um, things are imposed on a farmer and they're not trusted by a farmer. And so how do we develop this tie uh, structure of soil doctors, which really promotes uh, farmer to farmer. So that's uh, some of the things that I'd like to touch upon when we uh, when we have a, a conversation. So let me now turn to our third speaker. Um, Davide Sepper is a CEO of Varda. It's a startup that specializes in providing supporting technologies to make better use of field level data. Tell us about it. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I have a few slides, actually, because I normally start the presentation about uh, what is Varda with a very complicated um, data flow diagram that explains how many actors exist in the industry and how many different data formats exist that make it very compli complicated and messy to elaborate that data and make really extract meaningful knowledge. But instead, I found, if you go to the next page, uh, a much more meaningful an immediate image of what I meant with that. Uh, this is a famous painting by Peter Bruegel uh, representing the bubble tower. And that's exactly what happens today when it comes to data in agriculture. Formats are 
uh, there's very few standards. There's numerous uh, data formats. The quality of the data oftentimes is not up to the expectations of those who need to analyze, as, as Mr. Vargas just said. And, um, and this creates big barriers to adoption of technology and more importantly, to the uh, understanding of what is actually happening on the field. And so Varda was created precisely to remove the, the barrier of uh, data interoperability. In fact, we're owned by Yara 100% right now, the multinational, multinational uh, Norwegian uh, fertilizer company. Uh, but our goal is to do, right now we're working on two things. And the first ambition that we have on the next page is developing what we call the global field ID, uh, which is, in our opinion, the number one pillar to, uh, re to reduce complexity and simplified data exchange uh, capabilities. Uh, think about a city where everybody gives a different name to uh, every street. It's impossible to meet. We wouldn't be here today. That's exactly what happens today in agriculture. So there is an ever proliferating number of tools and systems, and all of them define the fundamental unit of production of food, which is the field, with a different name. And even farmers themselves sometimes on the same tool, they change the name year after year or season after season. And this makes it extremely complex. And we've seen it with our experience in some pilots to draw any meaningful aggregation of data and to contextualize information if we want to build, for example, a carbon footprint or a sustainability index for, uh, for food production, which is what is essential if we want to really change our food systems. Uh, so what we built is a uh, very simple system that, catalog, uh, that creates a catalog of field, data, of field boundaries in every, in every country right now. This is operational only in a couple of countries, but we want to scale it globally. Uh, and an API that allows you to search for a GPS location or share a polygon and obtain a single identifier for that very polygon. So that then every actor in the chain can more easily aggregate the data and, 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 and the information can flow a lot more easily. And we all have the same address for the name street finally, hopefully. Uh, so this is our number one and number one focus area. We plan to, uh, to um, provide this as a service globally, uh, building a coalition of multinational and local players uh, that can use the service to, um, to enable the, uh, the changes that we want to drive. The second thing uh, on the other page, since we're all talking about soil is a, um, free tool that we want to develop leveraging the same data platform infrastructure that we have, which is focused on making data, soil data more easily accessible uh, to catalyze collaboration in the industry around the topic of soil data. And this is meant to be, like I said, a, non, a free, free of charge tool uh, that essentially collects multiple data sources from available uh, publicly available data sets, uh, ingest them and makes comparison of uh, spatial and temporal uh, data sets so that we can assess the main characteristics of soil and the main properties of soils around the world. And then identify areas of the world where there is a gap of information so that more information can be collected and potentially create campaigns with private uh, donors and multinationals uh, like Yara and other um, like-minded institutions who would finance campaigns in a public-private partnership model so that we can fill in the gaps because there are areas of the world where is way too much data and areas where there is too little data and ultimately provide this platform to researchers and soil experts so that we can drive more information and uh, insights about where how to inform policy and what kind of actions would be useful uh, to enhance uh, yields for example and sustainability drivers in the uh, production of food thank you Excellent. Thank you very much, Davide. So I will never forget that picture that you showed, and I think it's much more powerful than a, than a jumble of uh, uh, Venn diagrams. Thank you for that. I think what stands out for me is the need for uh, visualization of data. Um, and even more importantly, just making sure that we sort out what data we have before we can go to what Roland was talking about, taking the data and creating policies out of them. Because we have to start somewhere with you before we can go uh, to actually collecting them and sorting them and then using them for policies and actions. So we are now going to go to a different corner of, of the universe, and that corner is a farmer. And uh, we have a great pleasure to have with us a Danish farmer, uh, Knud B. Schmidt. And uh, what I'd like to ask Knud is, what are the needs of the future generation on a farm? And how do you see data on soil health and how can they help you? And what do you need from, from these set of speakers here to make sure that the data can be usable, can be used, and you can have them day in, day out on your farm so that you can make better decision? Knud, the floor is yours. 
Hey, thank you. Um, I will start with with the presentation of my farm, and then um, and then try to answer your questions afterward. Um, the first slide is just a picture of our farm. Um, it is uh, 250 hectare, and um, it is a varying soil type with sand, clay, and humus in, in the same fields. So that means uh, um, that means it's good to have data um, when when we manage it. Um, the the climate here is temperate and with a rainfall at around 800 meter millimeter all over the year. Um, so, so we don't really face serious drought or heavy uh, damaging rain. Um, we, tr we try to follow the conservation agricultural principle and we don't do any tillage other than uh, using a straw harrow after harvest to spread the straw. The conservation uh, principle um, minimize the risk of erosion and have had uh, made the fields more fertile in just a few years. The no-till system is actually not very rare here in Denmark, um, where the main part of the farmers, they still do um, heavy tillage. Um, the yield uh, and the crops are, are grain, wheat, barley, oat, uh, and oil seed, grass seed. The yields in grain is from six to 10 ton, and oil seed for five ton, and beans and peas uh, uh, four to six, which is quite typically for a Danish farm. Then next slide, please. Um, the first time we used uh, GPS uh, for soil testing is approximately 20 years ago. Um, we used it uh, for applying lime and uh, it was applied at a variable amount. Uh, with our varying soil types, it is very beneficial to uh, apply uh, the lime at a variable rate. Um, later on, did we do uh, the scanning of the fields with, uh, you know, find the texture of the of the field, and now we use this, as you can see on the map. When we before we do the soil testing, now we we make a root or him who do it on his uh, little ATV. So, so that we, um, we we make the samples according to what uh, is what sort of soil it is. Um, combined with with yield mapping and the NDVI uh, from the satellite, is it now much easier to decide where we put more or less uh, fertilizer on? The fertilizer that we vary is normally nitrogen and potash. We use an app. We call it farm tracking on our, on our phone. And uh, for example, while we're driving in the field, we, we type in uh, some troublesome weed. It could be teasel or it could be wild oat. And then later on, we can spot spraying that uh, after this, uh, after this, after the app, you know, where, where the location. The same apps we use to register all sorts of uh, fields work. We do a plan in advance and then we just tick off uh, when it's completed. Using this app is very uh, useful when it comes to the mandatory pesticides record and uh, fertilizer record that we have to do these things in Denmark now. Um, of other tools, uh, creating data on our farm is the weather station. It measures all what is relevant and uh, within weather and store it for years. We use it to decide when to spray it and, and later on to control the relation between the weather data and the results of our, of our treatment. Uh, the weather station is linked to other station in, this, in the area and we can see then the weather, if the weather is changing close to us, uh, which is good to know before we make a decision. Um, the system also offer a early warning if some fungus is, is uh, in the in the way, in the, and uh, we can then prepare in advance spraying uh, fungicide on grain or something like that. Um, of other data we'll keep in the sky is all the bookkeeping. Soon will all sorts of public documents only be accepted electronically here in Denmark. And then next slide, please. 
Um, there's no doubt that even more data will be created on a farm in the nearby future. All from when we do various tasks to not we don't uh, to what we don't get done. Um, the authorities uh, they demand documentation for any inputs. It's more or less like the inventors of all new gadgets and software encouraged to uh, continue the process. If something is measure, if something is possible to measure and store it in the sky, we just must do it. Even more demanding is the consumers, or maybe rather the industry who process the product from the farms. They like to add little stickers on a packet saying that this pro product is without this or that. Um, with the present shortage of many types of fertilizer and other commodities and the raising costs, is it even more necessary to be efficient? Also here is data important because if you don't know your cost, then you, then how would you know what to plant and when to sell? The use of field data is also a major tool in how to lower the environmental impact of food production, all from avoiding nitrogen to leads and creating nitrous gases to the use of pesticide can be minimized. The more we learn about how to use the many years of stored field data. That was what I have to say. Um, and then back to your questions, if, it's, if, if, if I should try to answer them now. Uh, Knud, I think we'll answer them in the next round. Um, okay. I think this is a great introduction. Uh, thank you. And uh, what, I, what I take out for, uh, for the follow-up conversation uh, would be a couple of things. Uh, you're showing us how to do practical application of data. So what our first speaker, Lian, was talking about and what Ronald was talking about, you know, you're actually applying it and you're using it. Um, you touched upon what customers and governments are demanding. And uh, very important was your last, uh, last uh, statement about, you know, in the environment of availability and affordability issues when it comes to plant nutrients, one has to be even more uh, careful about the applications and use data to do that. So we'll pick that up in a follow-up conversation. But now I'd like to go and uh, give a floor to Leonardo Zvergutz. Chair of Soil Science at the University UM6P in Morocco. Um, Leonardo, you do a lot of research on this topic. What we'd like to know is what you propose to increase the, the uptake of science-based soil health management. Over to you, Leonardo. Thank you very much, Asbeta, and thank you, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here with all of you, great panelists, and discussing such an important topic here today. Uh, I don't know if the, the slide's gonna be uh, brought there. Yep. Okay, so uh, my name is Leonardo Zvergut. I'm a professor at Mohammed VI Polytechnique, and I'm leading the Chair of Soil Science, which is a research program funded by uh, OCP. And what I'm going to bring in this term of uh, discussing soil health is a uh, few discoveries that we had during uh, as part of this work that we did uh, through most of last year, which is, if you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, the European Union and the African Union, they got together and then they set up a bunch of advisory groups to work on policy papers to guide how the research and innovation between the two continents should, ha should happen. And then uh, together with uh, Professor Daniel Naun, I was able to be part of this advisory group on how the green transition should happen in Africa. And then, uh, so during nine months last year, this, uh, this final paper, it was published now during the African Union, European Union Summit, which was uh, uh, happened in uh, February this year. And then some of the very interesting conversations that we had through during nine year, during nine months last year with the African commissioners, European commissioners and other stakeholders, uh, we found many interesting things about the green transition in Africa. And then of course, Africa does need lots of sanitation. Africa needs lots of uh, green energy solutions, energy grids, a bunch of different things. But at the end at the core of the green transition in Africa then should be worldwide as well, but particularly in Africa, uh, it lays the soil security. We can only bring the green transition, we can only bring a sustainable Africa if uh, Africa is able to secure its soils. If Africa is able to secure its soils, it's gonna bring water security, food security, nutrition security, uh, biodiversity protection, uh, climate change abatement, and all these things. So the soils, they are at the core of this green transition in Africa. And to bring these to secure soils, to bring healthy soils, 
we need to develop these sustainable agricultural practices that we are discussing here today. And if you can go to the next slide, please. The link for this uh, paper is there on the on, on this slide. Uh, one more, please. So if we uh, if we look into Africa now, so there is uh, nothing new there. So Africa is still the place where people still suffer the most from hunger. So it's a very stressed environment in this sense. If you can click again, next one. Uh, then if you look into the near future, things are only should get worse because Africa is still the place where population is growing the most. The next coming decades, African population is gonna double. This year alone, Africa is importing $55 billion in food. If nothing is done by 2030, this number is gonna raise to $110 billion in food. So what, you, what it happens when you take this already stressed situation, people, they are suffering the most from hunger, population is growing a lot. If you can click next again. So these people trying to produce food in what we have as the oldest soils on earth, and then these highly weathered soils, they share some very uh, similar characteristics all around the tropics, which they are acidic soils. They are very low fertile so soils, it's naturally. So these people trying to produce food in these very poor soils, very easily they deplete the soils. And then when the soils, it's not able to produce biomass anymore, then we have this soil degradation, which is uh, this uh, looming crisis all around the continent. So this is what I'm calling this vicious cycle of poverty and land degradation in Africa. So how do we cut this cycle? How do we break this cycle? We break this cycle by bringing soil security, by bringing healthy soils, by bringing the sustainable agriculture, by teaching the farmers on how to do the sustainable agriculture that's gonna allow them to take care of the soils. And then now break this vicious cycle and now bringing the right nutrients, bringing the right management practices, bringing carbon to the soils. Now they break this vicious cycle of poverty. Now they are gonna be able to produce food bringing out this virtuous cycle of prosperity and land soil protection. So if the, we are able to bring soil security to Africa, we unleash this green transition in Africa. And then we, we break not only the cycle of uh, land degradation, but also the cycle of poverty in Africa. And just the last slide, uh, connecting to what we are discussing here. During these nine months of conversations, we also found out that, uh, again, data it's very important for Africa as well. It was very nice to see like uh, the, the slide from, from Lee saying, showing like how many points we have in Africa. But when we discuss with these people, this, uh, this data, it's not really available. Where is this data? And then if we look to like uh, what was showed by David. So, and then if we go to World Bank, if we go to uh, Gates Foundation, if you go to many donors, most of them would show the same points. But now where is this data? So this data, then we should have this fair data principles and procedures so that data is findable, accessible, uh, interoperable, and reusable. So we can really use this data, not only the technical aspects, but also most important now for Africa, how to translate this into policies so we can secure our soils. And then this is what I, I had to, to bring today. Thank you very much, and hopefully we can have some good discussions. Right. Thank you very much, Lon Iris. So your presentation strikes me as the why. I mean, you really highlighted why we need to do all this. And what is really standing out for me is how soil health is actually so critical to not only food security, which is logical, but also to water security, to climate change abatement and everything else. This is where it starts. So this is the, this is the big why, if you will. And a second point, the, the number that you quoted on food import bill is absolutely staggering. And if you think about the population growth and degradation of soils in Africa, that number is going to grow, as you said, double, basically. So it, it really focuses one's mind as to what needs to be done um, to make a change there. So plenty to follow up on in our, in our conversation. And now I'd like to uh, turn to, to the last, but not least, uh, very important speaker, Dr. Matthias Paul who is head of uh, Global Societal Outreach Agricultural Solutions at BASF. Um, I understand that you have several solutions that you can offer to this forum. I'd love you to describe it and tell us about it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elzbeta. So the <clears throat> BASF view here on, on this very critical topic is maybe a view of a very multinational ag input provider. And that is maybe something that, that fits very well to what Knut has shown us here. So. One thing is absolutely clear, and I'm grateful that I can share uh, some views here about this very important topic. 
um, the the key to transforming agriculture into more resilient systems is connected to soil health. We all know that, and data to promote soil health is something that is uh, that is critical. I I would like to um, stress two different areas here. On the one hand side. Knut, as I said, already pointed to the fact is making data available for field management. On the other side, we have the big topic of carbon sequestration and data related to carbon sequestration and measures to um, make this kind of activity somehow um, yeah, incentivizable, put it that way. Um, so these are the two topics that I find very important. So what is the BSF contribution here? Uh, we have, and all the egg input providers have similar tools. We have Xavio, what is a, a tool that is digital agriculture toolbox for uh, make to make use of in, in various uh, areas of, of farming. So we've got a field manager, we've got a scouting app. These apps are providing data on disease, on pest pressure, but also on, on nitrogen uptake, for example, for the, for the plants. We have uh, also the field manager who's providing field zone specific data historically, but also current data on biomass development, on historic yield, on actually yield on, on uh, nutrition availability. And this all provides a very broad spectrum of data available to the farmer to optimize the, the activities. And uh, Knut has shown a lot of pictures. Um, I also heard this little bit of concern here about that this is also demanding, creating data also, whatever is sparking a kind of interest in making these data available to everybody. And there's a lot of reporting and governments and authorities want to take part in all this. This is a challenging and demanding environment for the farmers, that's clear. On the other side, it also provides a lot of, um, yeah, whatever positive uh, op options for the farmer. And I would say, the whole uh, toolbox that is offered by by the egg input providers this is a kind of a, a start of a journey put it that way so it it continues all these data that are available through the these, these uh, systems are very specific to the regions uh? what you can get from xavio in the us is something completely different from what you can get in europe and this develops in in multiple countries and it is very specific so this is really great and really um, custom focused. And the, the other point is that there are also new tools. So biodiversity measures, for example. So the tool is offering you the right spots on your fields, the exact field zones where which biodiversity measure is best suited. So these kind of data give us an insight in what's possible in the future. So that is about the, the digital toolbox, uh, very important. And the other point that I want to like to speak to briefly, that is carbon sequestration. And I guess there's no doubt, carbon in the soil, carbon sequestration is, is pivotal. It's crucial for soil health. And um, so it has, it has two points. On the one hand side, we know all this is important. And we know that there is a lot of things that you can do to improve carbon content in the soil to improve soil health. The question is uh, how to measure that. And methodologies that are accepted broadly, globally, are really important. And this is not really the case yet. There is a lot of discussion about that. It's also difficult since carbon content is, content is very variable. It's going up and down. And so in the end, it needs uh, a kind of credible, reliable data source for carbon content. And this, and the next step is then also the, the critical basis for creating a system that incentivizes farmers for doing this kind of activities to changing the farming practice. Again, this is different in developing countries or in, in uh, developed countries. So uh, we have to really look at it case by case. We have different uh, approaches towards carbon credits. We all work on that making sure that in the end, the farmer is the one who's benefiting from this credit is, is key and making sure that data that are used are really reliable. And I, last word, would like to uh, refer to, um, to Joe Puri, 
who said in a in a dinner speech uh, two days ago that everybody is biased uh, and data are always uh, a kind of a matter of a biased view uh, and she said uh, whatever challenge your bias rock your bias and that is what i really like to spread here as a take-home message when we talk about data really look at the data and find a, a kind of mechanism that makes it credible and usable uh, for the for the common goal to improve resilience and soil health thanks Fabulous. Thank you very much. Uh, rock your bias. I think I'll remember this for a long time. Uh, but what you highlighted is extreme importance of biodiversity. Um, and I think this is something that is going to pick up speed uh, going forward. I see biodiversity being 10, 15 years behind climate, but it is picking up very quickly and we will need good data for that. Um, and a second one, uh, carbon sequestration. There's a lot of debate about data for that. I think we can easily delve uh, deeper into it. So now that we have lay of the land from this esteemed panel and thank you for joining us uh we're gonna go to a bit of a conversation um so i would like to start with uh knud um and then uh leanne so knud i uh i really find it very interesting how you describe what's happening on a farm but I, i'd also like to acknowledge the, the the new generation that you are probably in touch with whether it's your children whether it's other farmers whether it's children of other farmers i was wondering if uh if the youth um, is bringing different ideas on the farm, if the youth is asking different questions, and if you see different level of acceptance of technology or demand of technology from the younger generation of farmers. And the other thing you mentioned that there is a, a customer, your client, your consumer, and they are more demanding and they are asking for different things. So what are you seeing in terms of both on the farm and also demand for new technologies and new mapping of data and new data disclosure traceability from the younger generation. Knud, over to you. Um, of course, it, it is like the, <laughs> I used to call myself a, a first generation uh, gadget person, but, but those who have been born up with it, they, uh, I mean, they are much more used to it's just there and 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 of course we can measure this and we can find information about that um but um i i don't know if if it's just about um i mean though, depending on when you say young people is it the consumer or is it those who want to join farming because for me there's still a big difference in, in that, those particularly here in Denmark, they, there's, there's very few who want to join farming, but there's a lot of young people who have an idea about how to farm. It's, as we say, it's, it's the wrong people who farm because it's the only one who don't know how to do it. But, but uh, I think that a lot of today's topic is about telling a small story more than it, it is the fact. I mean, if I start arguing about uh, my way of farming, conservation, agriculture, and then they always come up with, but you use Roundup or glyphosate. I say, yes, I do. And then it doesn't help me that I say, yes, but the alternative is not to do anything. The alternative is heavy tillage, the erosion and, and soil health is spoiled and all that. But um, so, so it's, so it's, <laughs> it's like you have to make data sexy as someone says, because if, if you just, show a lot of Excel uh, 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 where, where with a lot of data, it's just, we don't want to hear, we don't want to look at it. So to, to combine the data with, with the, you know, with the progress or the process we are into, it have to be somehow sold to the consumer in a way that they see the link between what they demand and, and, and the consequence of what they demand. Uh, it's maybe not always what they think it is. Uh, so so um, it's not that yeah, simple to say just because you are young, then you then you are smart. <laughs> <laughs> makes a lot of sense, Knud. And I think what you're describing, make data exciting, but also make sure that whatever is demanded by the consumer uh, is not mutually exclusive with what actually is doable on a farm, right? We can We can all have lots of demands to the farmer of how to farm but at the end of the day you the farmer know the best how to actually produce something with a minimum carbon footprint and uh with maximum uh sort of sustainability taken into account and it it's not always what it what you think it is right so so thank you for highlighting that 
I'd like to turn now to Lee. Uh, so you were talking in your initial um, in your initial presentation about uh, power of consistent monitoring and what you know what it takes to actually do that, but also empowering decisions with data. Um, can you give us any examples from your work um, where things have gone well? And especially, you you must be working with farmers, and you must have you must see how they do decisions every day. So. Can you, can you highlight a few examples of what you've seen on the farm or in your science work? Over to you, Lee. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And thanks for this great conversation. And I think this relates also to what the professor from Morocco was talking about, was this real cycle of how land and soil degradation is you know, impacting poverty, food and nutrition security. And so making informed decisions is critical. And this is what we call the research and development approach here at C4ECRAF, where we're embedding the research into development. So it's no longer separate, but that the science is adapted. And that includes the monitoring has been adapted to provide information that's accurate, but rapid, and at the time the decisions are being made. So one example, and I'll just show my, continue my bias here in Kenya, um, is with the county government of Makoweni. So we have actually been working with them to first map all the interventions, um, projects going on in this county, working with farmers and spatially plotting it, and then designing this decision, or they call it a resource dashboard where we've been putting all of the soil carbon maps, soil pH maps, soil erosion maps, tree cover maps, as well as trends in agriculture, yields of different crops, water consumption, climate. All of this is co-designed in an open access online decision dashboard. Now the county they're going in, figuring out where the hotspots are, you know, prioritizing action areas. The Case Up Crawl um, program is a government program funded um, by EFAD. So yes, I'm a big fan of Joe Curry as well. And we're looking at how to incentivize farmers Okay, Lee, we lost you. Uh, are you back? Can you hear yep. me? Uh, to incentivize farmers to implement these uh, agricultural practices. So I think this Makoweni County is a perfect example of how county level decisions, farmer level decisions, and now investors um, are using these data to prioritize their interventions. But again, and I think um, BASF uh, mentioned this, tracking how these interventions are influencing soil health, including soil carbon sequestration. So happy to put the link to that dashboard in the chat here. This is great. Thank you very much. That, those, are, those are great examples from, from, uh, from where you are in Kenya. So I'd like to now turn to Davide. And, and I have two questions. Uh, one question, obviously, is how to, make, how to make data exciting. I think Newt said sexy, I'd say exciting. How do you make it exciting? But there's also a question from the chat, a uh, question to you, the issue of um, data ownership and confidentiality in your work. So for example, how does Varda protect information for the farmers and landholders? Yeah. Over to you, David. Well, I'll start from the first because I, I, <clears throat> I wanted to applaud to Knut's comment. Uh, first of all, to him for being a pioneer in regenerative, regenerative farming practices in Denmark, as he said, not many farmers are still doing that and there should be more of them. But the topic of making data, I don't know if it's exciting, but really meaningful. And by that, to me, I think the core issue of, and the reason why we're in this tragic situation with respect to loss of natural capital and degradation of, of land and, uh, and water resources is because we are blind to the huge externalities that our system produces. Uh, we've been buying food for decades without attributing the full cost of it because it was impossible to capture these elements. And so, uh, Matthias spoke about you know, the importance of carbon farming, which is a big element in driving incentives for farmers. We need to create a system, and that's ultimately my dream, is to create a system that is able to price the actual full price of food production and recognize the merits of those farmers who are taking pioneering efforts and taking risk, because if you need to change your practices, uh, sometimes it means also taking risk. 
so that that price and that cost is really, and the value for society is reflected in the ultimate price that the, the food stuff um, uh, fetches on the market. So if, there, if it's easy to criminalize the multinationals or to you know, gener generically talk about an ingredient uh, from the crop protection industry, because uh, you know, catchy phrases are a lot more popular and easy to remember. But if we were all be able, to, if we would all be able to price the food at the right level, incorporating all of the elements uh, and reward the farmers that are really doing um, uh, the right stuff on the ground and applying the right ingredients and minimizing inputs and increasing efficiency, and then that would translate into a uh, differentiated pricing level. So the, the real problem is that today commodities are the same price for every farmer, even though the way they produce food is different. And so in my opinion, traceability enabled by a, a unified and standardized identification system for fields is really what can drive the link between consumer willingness to pay and bring into surface and making visible those practices that are otherwise lost uh, and ultimately depend on the goodwill of the farmer or on local incentives. Uh, so that's, in, in, in my view, the way we can make data more exciting to create a real price signal for, for food. Uh, with respect to, um, to uh, confidentiality, one of the things that we decided with Varda since the beginning was to focus on uh, non-contentious data, non-personal data. So we don't collect information about the farmers. And if you, um, if you look at our infrastructure, the whole... Uh, field ID system is grounded on the fact that fields do not have necessarily a property or an owner attached to it. That can be that link can be created via the connectivity that we're going to establish with the farm management systems and the different applications that the farmers use. And uh, we have established a permissioning system uh, in the platform, platform so that if any data, uh, aside from the location and the size and some of the information that can be collected via satellite, which is public, um, is to be shared, it will be up to the farmer to decide. And typically there is a reason to do so. And that reason is because I can document my farming practices and therefore I can get a carbon credit recognition or a premium price because my food uh, company or the contract uh, company that I'm selling my crop to is willing to recognize the premium. And there are examples, especially in the Nordics, but increasingly more examples of food companies that are willing to pay a premium uh, for certain practices. So uh, that, is, that is where we solve the problem, but obviously we then also have audit mechanisms to make sure that the practices that we apply on treating the data um, are uh, respectful of uh, regulation. Thank you very much. So um, you propose one solution to making data more exciting, which is to get farmer incentivized on the right outcome. I'm sure just presenting it through the Babel Tower is another way to make it exciting, but we can, we can go into that some other time. We have a question from the chat and I'd like to turn to you, Leonardus. <clears throat> I think you are the soil doctor in the room. And so there's a question to, uh, I think it's to you. Um, good morning, I'm a dairy farmer from Nigeria. And what you are speaking about, dwindling quality of soil in, in Nigeria is absolutely correct. And it's having a toll on agri-commodity yield. I have planted corn for silage with poor yield, very disappointing yield. Any advice, any thoughts on how data and how information can help farmers being more productive in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa? Thank you very much for the question. And uh, well, of course, uh, to answer this, we should be going to the field. And this is one of the things like with all this data discussion now, uh, lots of times we discuss as uh, satellites, all these things, they will do all the tricks. This is very important so we can as a management tool, but uh, to really answer questions like that, we should go to the field and understand what the farmer needs right there. Of course, I don't know what uh, is the problem there, but uh, if we can say from what we have been seeing there, it's literally we have to, measure things in the soil. We have to understand what is the most limiting factor now for this, uh, I don't know, corn production for the, 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 this dairy farm. And most of the time in Africa, it would be a nutrient limitation. Because again, these are the oldest and poorest soils that we have on earth. And uh, if we want to solve this problem and then produce more, first of all, we need to understand what is the real issue. So we have to go there and then really uh, gather data on uh, evaluating the soils, evaluating the plants, and then really understanding what is the, is the most limiting factor uh, for this production. But just to, if I can put now my, my farmer's head. So I come from a farmer's family. Uh, my, my, my parents, they are farmers in Brazil. All my relatives, they, they are farmers in Brazil. So once we talk about these limitations with a farmer, so it's a given example, like Knud said. So uh, it is 
all the time, all the toll is, is usually put on the farmer's uh, shoulders. So they are the ones degrading the soil. They are the ones really degrading the environment. But then if, who, who here, if you go to the farmer, you're gonna go there and then see many sensors, many things that they are getting the data, but then what they're doing with this data now. So it's really taking like what David is saying. So we have to make this data meaningful. If we want to solve this issue with this, uh, this uh, farmer that asked the question here, we have to go there, generate some data and understand what is the most limiting factor. And then we can start solving uh, the issues with, uh, with the farmer. Because as Knud said, so then it was mentioned here. So if we want to change practices, this is not an easy thing to do. All the time it said like, uh, oh, the farmers, they should just do this and then solve the issues of the world and save and sequester carbon. But this, we have to understand the farmers, they must make money. They don't degrade the soils because they want most of the time, they are not being able to take care of themselves, of their life. So how do you expect them to take care of the environment? So, but then just uh, some, some comments, but again, uh, we should go there and measure, but most of the times it's really the soils that are being depleted. And then this is the, we need to bring the right nutrients to support this uh, plant production. Thank you very much, Leonardo. So that's the message to, uh, to our dairy farmer from Nigeria. We have a question in the room and all the others, please come in. I'd love to take questions from here. Uh, thank you very much. Just to follow on um, from what you just said, my question is really about mobilization of resources to achieve outcomes based on the aggregation of data that you're doing and it's incredible work you're doing. In more developed wealthier countries, farmers can afford to look three, four, five years ahead in their soils. They have the cash flow that they can address micronutrient deficient, uh, sorry, micronutrient deficiency, uh, bacteria and biology deficiencies. Smallholder farmers in Africa uh, spend quite a bit of time there. They look at what's happening the next year. They generally go and buy the cheapest bag of fertilizer they can possibly get, um, which might not necessarily be going to contribute to their soil health. How do we financially incentivize those smallholder farmers to look ahead for that two to three years when they're more worried about their subsistence cash flow that they're actually living on? What can corporations, companies and multinational institutions do to help finance that transition? Because it's really about, it's an issue of financing these farmers through a transition of improving their soils? That's a great question. And I don't know who would like to pick this up from the panel. Um, I don't think we have actually finance experts here, but I was wondering, Lee, do you have any views on incentives for the farmers? Because uh, you're probably closest to the ground at this point in, in Africa and, and Ronald after that. Yeah, this is such a great question. And I would just like to highlight that the Coalition of Action for Soil Health, which grew out of the UN Food System Summit and continues to grow, has four goals. And the fourth one is really about increasing financial incentives to support farmers to make this transition. And we've even put a number on it, five to tenfold increase in these financial incentives. And I think the first step is exactly what we're doing today is having diverse stakeholders at the table, scientists, farmers, private sector, and NGOs, research organizations, bringing everyone together to really start outlining what are the key challenges we need to address and then the roadmap of how we address them. There are several exciting um, initiatives that are piloting the incentivization uh, for farmers to make this transition with financial means. And of course, uh, these are mostly based around the carbon market. And this is, I think, a positive trend. And already the carbon market is seen as not being enough. We need to include gender equity, social inclusion, biodiversity above ground and below ground. But I really do urge uh, all of us to have this conversation, develop these platforms. We're planning a lot of events in COP27 to continue um, to strategize on this roadmap because we have to scale soil health globally and we all have to work together. Like you mentioned, it cannot just be the burden on the farmers. We all have a responsibility to do what we can. Thanks yeah. so much. Thank you, Ron. Yes. <clears throat> well, currently this issue of car the carbon market and particularly carbon, so organic carbon sequestration, of course, is everybody wants to get carbon credits out of soils, but behind that there is, of course, a simple and clear message is that that's a long-term solution, okay? So if you want to really generate and purchase carbon credits are coming from soils, you need to wait because it will take some time. There are many protocols available. For instance, as we are in FAO, we develop tools 
together with all countries develop and developing so that the, the mixture of the different circumstances come together. And we have, for instance, the MRB protocol for this, sustainable soil management protocol to measure all the other ecosystem services, et cetera. And we have a program called REC Soil that is giving farmers incentives, technical incentives, but also some financial incentives because the moment you a farmer will adopt good practice and will change the things they are doing, there will be a temporary income, income gap. Who will pay for this? Not the farmer, particularly those in, in situations that are not in wealth. Therefore, they really need to get these incentives. But currently, if we talk about the carbon market per se, there are no rules because under the Convention on Climate Change, the Article 6 was not approved or agreed by countries. So the carbon market currently does not have strict rules that can guide this trying to give the real value to the carbon credits because this is who's putting the price now, the yeah. price for this carbon. Exactly. We don't have this. Yeah. So there are many things that we need to consider and we need to be very clear. This takes time. There are protocols to measure and the issue is not to measure. The issue is to demonstrate that there are risks associated with that and we need to tell them clearly that there are risks. But the issue here is not just to generate more carbon. The issue is to talk about how to improve soil health. And this is something that we need to also consider. If, and I will give you an anecdote. Uh, in, in the eighties, we had the World Soil Charter that was endorsed by all countries in FAO. We tried to uh, update it in 2015. Yep. But when we read the charter and we read the problems that we, the world was facing in that time already, they were exactly the same problems that we are facing now. So we were wondering, then what Does are we move? doing to solve this? Yeah. Are, we, are we going to keep solving crisis or are we going to take soils, ma soil management seriously? And soil management is not a short-term aspect. It is a more medium to long-term perspective. Absolutely. So I will just uh, close this question and then we have two more questions and then we're going to, unless you have something quick to add. Very quick add this. to this one. I think that one of the drivers from the multinational side is that I don't, I don't think that any of the most important multinationals in the food and agricultural sector has not made any uh, pledge on being net zero nature positive within the next few decades. And that is going to mobilize a lot of finance precisely yeah. for the offset that we're talking so about. So I'll just add one last thing before we go to question here and question there. Uh, Sustain Africa initiative, which is spearheaded by Rabobank, uh, uh, Gates Foundation, and ourselves at IFA, tries to bring it concessional funding where the fertilizer and other plant nutrients are provided, and then there is concessional funding to agro dealers and all the way to the farmer. That's one of them, but we absolutely need to bring multilateral development banks to the equation. That is the that is one, and we need to bring commercial banks in Africa to that equation too. So we have a question here, and then we have a question on the line. Thank you. Uh, very interesting presentation and speakers. I appreciate the diversity of views that are being and expertise that's being brought to the table. Um, when I think about soil health, I do think about it as a building block to overall biodiversity. And I am struck by the fact that yes, biodiversity is going to be such a big conversation for us all to grapple with. And then so my question and kind of the thoughts that I'm working through as I listen to this is, um, is the level of data that we have now, is it helping us to see the potential of using nature in our agricultural systems, number one? And is it helping us to determine what is best use, uh, what is the best use of the land? So the one example that I had to kind of illustrate this point is that um, in the Canadian beef sector, we had a couple of converse, uh, conservation situations wherein there was no grazing happening. Um, and as a result, some of the soil health, some of the grass health and the biodiversity Diversity there was dropping. Yeah. And once we brought ruminant, ruminants back to the land, biodiversity increased. And of course, we only uh, determine that through science and data. Yeah, perfect. I, I'm sure there are many examples I would love to hear. Yeah. So maybe, Matthias, to... you mentioned biodiversity in your presentation. Do you want to just say a couple of words? Uh, and then we're going to wrap up because we're running out of time. Yeah, yeah very, very briefly. I, I think that's a very important point. Yeah? And as I said, this is a journey. And I think that there's a lot of opportunities to include even whatever things that you're not have on your on your page uh, at, at immediately at the beginning. But this is a good example. So biodiversity is a, is a complex uh, animal, I would say. Yeah? So it's difficult to tackle, but it's important to have the right data sources and putting that into a, a toolbox 
that is what we want to see in the next years to come, a digital toolbox that support farmers in doing the best, making the best decision. Thank you, Matthias. There was a question here. I have a question about data because you have a lot of knowledge about the data, but I'm wondering what kind, how can you use that data to say something about the practices that we need? What kind of practices should we encourage to increase soil health? And also I'm wondering more about the role of youth because this is an event about the role of youth. And the only thing I've heard is that it doesn't mean that you're smart because you're young. And I think we should add more Okay, to that. let me turn it on to you. What what should the youth do? I mean, you guys, we, we heard from Knut that you are running away from the farms. I don't think it's true. Uh, it was tongue in cheek, but but give us one or two things. You are digital natives. You 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 live on apps. Give us give us advice. We need it. Please give us one or two things that we can do differently. Yeah, Seriously. No, I think that the practices are the most important, that we need to understand how we can work with nature and not against nature in the ways that we practice uh, farming. Yep. And I think that's it's not because I want to be smart, it's because I'm very uh, frustrated and I don't want to live in a future where we don't have soil that can far, that we can farm at all. That's why we need to change the, um, the habits that we, the practices that we use, because we want soil health to to live in the future. So soil health at a core and then use data practices to be able to enhance it. I'd like to add what Roland said that this is a long-term proposition. This is not something that can be fixed. So we are running out of time. I'd like to do one last round. What I'd like to do is the following. I'd like to ask every speaker to give us one recommendation for the policymakers. There is a lot of policymakers sitting in the halls of this esteemed institution right now, drafting various communiques and various uh, recommendations to national governments. If you had a pen uh, today in your hand, what would you recommend to those policymakers? And Roland, let me start with you because you are so well versed in, in all the policies that need to happen around soil health. Well, we have been trying to say many policies, but look, okay, I will try to highlight. address what we have been discussing now. Soil health means that soil is alive and exactly soil biodiversity is crucial. And when we talk about data for a long time, soil surveys have been focusing in very few properties that are very much related to either erosion, fertility, but soil biodiversity, we don't have record of that. And we really need to do that because that is the future. Because if we understand the living part of our soils, we will know how to manage them. And of course, youth is fundamental there because you have innovation there. But the practices is not that you, we have many new practices. There are many common criteria and principles that we need to adapt and we can share, we have them. But the key here is that soils need to be managed in a long-term perspective, like a human being. And to finish, soil data is crucial, yes, but we need to understand something because there was a question about confidentiality ownership. In mm -hmm. how we have created with all soil, with countries, a soil data policy because people do not want to share raw data. I'm Thank a you. farmer and they said, I don't want my data from my garden to be shared globally. Yeah. Why? Yeah, yeah, we need to do that. Thank you. One sentence, Leonardus. Uh, advice to policymakers, what do they need to do? One sentence, please. For me, it's uh, giving the, like uh, it was, I think, David, giving the value to soil. Giving the value to soil. Davide. Simplify the KPIs. Give Simpli few simple metrics that everybody can uh, read and understand easily. Simplify the my, my metrics. I would yes. say use the, the whole toolbox of innovation free of any ideological barriers and, and tear use them down. Use the toolbox. Some... Knud, over to you. One sentence. What do you tell policymakers meeting here? They, uh, they should uh, understand that farming is always on long term, basic, whatever we do and changes take time. So, so use data, but don't abuse them to your decision. That's my mission. Okay, long term. And Leon, you are the last one. Uh, the wisdom, words of wisdom to policymakers. Close us in. Let, let's get soil health into the nationally determined contributions. That's simple and it relates to the upcoming UNFCCC COP. Let's get soil health and soil carbon in the NDCs contributing to climate change mitigations. That is fabulous. Thank you. So let me please ask all of you to give a huge round of applause to this esteemed panel. I think we mapped out the whys, we mapped out some of the house. We didn't have enough youth representatives, but thank you for correcting our course here. I really appreciate that. I wish it was a full hall where we can have many, many of you here, but I'd like to invite you and your colleagues to come and 
talk to us, come and write to us. We do need your input because you are a critical component of making sure we get it right. So round of applause on the screen and in the room to this panel. Thank you. Well done. This was great. Thank you. I picked that name from my email. So Nathan is, um, he's rather uh, more on the media relationship side, but he's the best contact I have with Savio at the moment. You want to 